It's for Murray. I can do it. I can do it for <clears> Murray. <throat> we can all look a state for Murray. And with that wise wonder being said, hello everyone and welcome <laughs> to a Failcast F1 podcast special where we are saluting the amazing man that was and still is and will continue to be Murray Walker. Alongside me, as always, is Mr. Definitely Zero himself. How are you? I, I'm okay. I'm okay, mate. I'm I'm gutted though. I was telling you before we went live. It's actually mm. hit me harder than I I thought it would actually. Um, and I find myself increasingly angry that he lived for over twenty years after quitting commentary, <laughs> and we lost out on those twenty years. Um, I'll get oh, into this mean? more in the actual stream, but I saw a, a video on YouTube of him um, three months ago, mm. and. The guy was just as Murray as ever, and we've we've lost twenty years of him. Uh, Beetlejuice, hello, mate. Very, very good. You could join us. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm not dead. It was Simon who nearly died with his uh, COVID, um, but you're alive, aren't you, Simon? I am alive, thank you. Just checking. Just about. So, um, just to talk everyone through what we're doing, um, mm -hmm. we will be driving uh, some Mansell Mania 1992. Williams uh, FW14Bs around Silverstone, obviously, mm. in memory of Murray, and uh, it'll be an all-classic grid of early 90s, late 80s cars. Uh, One-shot qualifying, 25% Grand, uh, Grand Prix distance, uh, damage is on, obviously, because otherwise it isn't fun, and uh, we will be sharing with you uh, our memories of the great man, um, a guy who... I can say with certainty I would not be the fan of F1 I am today without... Um, oh, excellent! Beetlejuice watched the Damon Hill Murray Walker Pizza Hut commercial in his honour. That is such a great <laughs> commercial that has aged immaculately. It has. That is the epitome of ninety stuff. Hello to Sam in the chat as well. Um, he's just put. Here, I came across your content recently and didn't realise I'd find two people who loved F one as much as me. So glad to have oh, you God with us. God bless you. And um, God bless you. Yeah, I think one of the things um, we were debating actually just before we was going live, do we go for this era of F1 or something slightly later? Um, and although this gives a bigger grid and things like that, for me, this was when um, the Murray Walker, and it, maybe it's a very British thing, um, but we, I used to basically bully my parents to schedule the Sunday roast around when the F1 was because we would then, well... My dad used to be a Formula One fan, so he'd be dragged into like the smoky living room and would be like, Oh, go for the cigarette smoke to the TV and you'd find like <laughs> Murray Walker would be there in the corner and I'd be sitting there stuffing pudding watching the Grand Prix and he was just um you said it in a message um through uh, Instagram. He was the voice of Sunday afternoon. Um and he, long may that remain. He he truly was. I mean I can't think of uh a public figure that was so integrated into the family life of people in the country. Mm. I, I really can't. I mean, I know there's like prolific entertainers, you know, like Bruce Forsyth, for example, was, you know, a oh, national yeah. treasure as well. Bruce but Spence. none of them, none of them um, really compared to Murray. And actually Beetlejuice, that's uh, fascinating to know. Uh, Beetlejuice says that even German language TV switched to Murray Walker commentary when Damon won the championship. I love that. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love that. Um, so without further ado, shall we jump into one-shot qualifying, balls yes. it up, and then we'll uh, make a balls <clears throat> of the race as well, but with Murray forever in our hearts. And we can talk about um, our memories of the man himself. Yeah. And, uh, if you don't mind, um, I wouldn't mind kicking us off. Um, Go for it. Go for it. Whilst we drive like a Murrayism. Yeah, because... Um, I remember the first Grand Prix I can remember sitting and watching with my grandparents mm. um, was, I want to say it was Adelaide, um, and I'm trying to think of what year, but it was, oh Christ, what was it? It was before for a Lacey's debut and he debuted 91 right 90 he debuted 90 oh god no maybe maybe Lacey was on the grid then um because I think I was around four 
why I was coming up on four. Mm -hmm. And obviously I don't remember anything about the race at the time. I just remember the cars, the colours, the noise, and that soundtrack of Murray <laughs> Walker. <laughs> when I really became cognizant of watching F1, uh, was probably 92 with, um, with Mansell mm -hmm. and Mansell Mania, which really was like, I don't think we've had a phenomenon in Britain like that since, because I mean, Damon Hill was, was my, my driver of choice, but his yes. championship wasn't met with the same fanfare, was it really? No, not, not nearly as much. Coulthard was completely overlooked, uh, Scottish, D yeah. Scorson. Um, and then, it, because he was then looked over for Button, and then um, it was straight to Hamilton and Army. So, yeah, no, you're right. But, but actually, nothing's ever yeah. really hit that fever dream of Mansell Mania. No, it hasn't. And, and I'm kind of wondering, to some extent, why that is. Um, because I know Murray loved damon hill and would always advocate for him and actually something else i you made me think about there by mentioning jensen button's name is is that after murray left the sport no one was really batting for button the way he did mm. i remember him making a big deal about button in that williams in 2000 yep. um but anyway we've already digressed off topic um <laughs> So yeah, my, my earliest memories really are of um, the 92 championship, um, the whole thing around Mansell. And the thing that I think held my attention, because what I used to find when I was, you know, re really first getting into F1, is that I actually enjoyed the build-up more than the race. Because <laughs> I wasn't, at, no, really, I wasn't at a point where I could appreciate the race craft, right? Hmm. What I enjoyed, what sucked me in, was the, the bit at the start where the camera's mulling up and down the grid, or you're looking at scenes from the helicopter, mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe they'd zoom in on a back of the grid car, and the name of the driver and the engine and the team would pop up, because yep. normally you wouldn't see them in the Grand Prix, because early 90s F1 coverage was fucking atrocious for <laughs> giving you an overview of who was where and what they were doing. True. And Murray would talk about what was going on. And he'd have mm -hmm. all this background information. And it's stuff that, if I repeated it, would sound super mundane. Bravo on your lap, by the way, sir. Bravo. You said you were going to be shit, but you lied to me. I, I, I still think I will be. I can't string two laps together, for goodness sake. <laughs> it's not going to be a very compelling race, I'm afraid, viewers. But it's not really about that. No. Um, uh, not that Mansell didn't, but Hill's Championship felt satisfying to non-British people as well. I'm interested to hear you say <clears throat> that, um, Beetlejuice, um, because Damon Hill's career has always been something that's mystified me, and it's something that we're going to go into more depth um, over the course of the Murray Memorial stream, because obviously uh, <laughs> I don't think any driver is more associated with Murray, perhaps other than Schumacher, um, mm. because I found that really interesting as, as well, and it's something else we will touch on, how Murray could be the biggest Damon Hill fan in the world and have such deep respect and admiration for Schumacher at the same time, um, which I think marked him out as a, as a man of genuine quality. Mm. But back, back, back to it. Um, he was um, sort of instantaneously engaging. Yes. And I think one of the things that... Um, pulls me from in from that is that it's because his enthusiasm was infectious and would cross the boundaries of whether you was technically minded, racing minded, just an onlooker kind of getting in. He had a way with words that meant that it crossed all sections so that you, you felt included and brought along for his childish enthusiasm way, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it, it's something that I, I, I genuinely miss because it's rare these days that you get, oh shit, I've immediately spun. Oh, uh, um... <laughs> Sorry, Murray. <laughs> he drove into me as well, the arsehole. Was that uh, four lights, five laps, and then straight <laughs> off into... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all right, it, it, it gives us something to watch now because I have to catch you guys up and uh, fight my way through the field of That's slower cars. I so. feel like I want to put in the uh, 1998 Spa commentary. This is the worst start crime crash I've seen in my life. When he comes <laughs> in with that as Coulthard eliminates oh. everyone. We're going to get so <laughs> deep into Murrayisms later because there's some that 
that I will forever adore. I, think, um, I can think of one you're going to pull out of the hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, get, getting hey, back Rhino. to the getting back to the man himself, right? Mm -hmm. it, the nostalgia I have for my childhood. He's he's intrinsically woven into it even before I was able to enjoy a race as a race. Mm. And like, even though no one in my family was actually a, an F1 fan, right? I mean, none of them. My grandparents weren't F1 fans. My, we watched every Grand Prix, but n no one ever watched it. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> it was just to have Murray on. I think. Like, I mean, I, I was too young to question it. It was just the way things were. We, we the family met on a Sunday afternoon every week without fail at my grandparents' house. We had roast beef and Yorkshire puddings and gravy and roast potatoes and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And just part of that was Country File, um, that stupid politics show with a crocodile made to look like Big Ben, um, <laughs> whatever that show was called. You'll remember what I mean, Simon. I think and, so. <clears throat> and then after that, it would be the Grand Prix. And yeah. it always, I mean, even though the races took part at point, <clears throat> part, uh, took place at different places all over the world at different times. Back in the 90s, it was always on sort of early afternoon, yeah, <laughs> regardless of where the race was or when it was held. One o'clock start. Um, and one of the things actually that came out from, uh, it was an interview with, uh, oh, Ted Kravitz. Um, he said that um, Murray Walker used to pretend that he was actually not in the studio and at the racetrack. And he'd be busy there talking about how hot it was yeah. in the box <laughs> and stuff like that. And they'd be looking at him and going, what? <laughs> because it but was it? it wasn't live then so you'd have to kind of inject a, a semi pretend live in if that makes sense and he was so good but at I, it i'd love that he would do that though yeah yeah do you know what i mean because because that makes his reaction seem all the more authentic at the time but it also makes his his reaction in reality somehow more wholesome <laughs> because yeah. you know he was I don't know if he recorded the um, the commentary after the fact, but if he did, I mean that's phenomenal, right? Because presumably he already knew the result. I don't. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they if they commentated as live and then it went out later or not. I have no idea. Because um, some because so, um, some stuff is like the Channel Four stuff that they get now is recorded as live and is done like put out later. So maybe it was like that at the time. I don't know, but fascinating. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've seen the clips as well, right? Of of him standing and being all animated, and mm -hmm. he really people use the word quite a lot to describe his sort of enthusiasm as almost childlike, and I can kind of get that because here we were looking at you know by the time he retired, he was already in his seventies. Mm -hmm. He he, you were a seventy year old man <laughs> with just such excitement and energy in his voice and a genuine love. <laughs> of what he was doing and he was bouncing up and down and I mean I remember um, towards the end of his career right he was um, taking rides in F1 cars do you remember he got strapped in and mm -hmm. driven by Martin Brundle I think at Australia yeah, yeah. 98 yeah in the TC seater I think wasn't it yeah yeah um, and I'm so glad he got to have that experience mm -hmm. uh, if I can think of anybody who deserved it it, it was him uh, and his commentary for that race, as I recall, was all the more passionate for it. Because yeah. suddenly he, he could describe, this is how it feels. Yeah, I'm struggling yeah. to get past this Jordan. I can feel he's going he's gonna to try and murder me if I try and get by. <laughs> and Murray would not approve of that. <clears throat> no, no. Now, uh, speaking of that, um, that's something else that many people have comment commented on. And I kind of agree with. He, he was never aggressive in his criticism of drivers you know Martin Brundle said disapproving is the correct word and I actually really agree with that yes because he's that, a you know man how of morals somehow isn't worse. He? you know how that's somehow worse you know people say when your parents say I'm not angry I'm just disappointed it hurts more yes <laughs> can you think of anything worse than like Murray disappointing Murray. Murray Walker yeah the yeah. nation's granddad <laughs> <laughs> Up there with, um, I think you said it as well in a in a thing in a comment. It's it's literally him and Sir David Attenborough would be the only kind of person I could 
imagine on the same type of plane of existence. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I said to you. I, I now have to go to war with God. Um, yeah, he cannot like, be taken this it. year. Take yeah. whoever you want, but Murray and David Attenborough, they are off limits, and he's broken the covenant. So, sorry, but someone's so going to have to put God in his place. It's just unacceptable. <laughs> um, I shall tweet him. Yeah. But yeah, when, when we bounce back to you now, uh, what are your earliest memories of, of Murray in, in F1? So my earliest memories of, um, I think I'm a couple of years older than ye. Um, oh, but you don't look it. Ah, I saw that uh, Photoshop and uh, nip and tucks. <laughs> and the amount of birthday cake I've been eating, it's my birthday tomorrow, so I'm a bit like, <laughs> proper picking it out. Um, <laughs> and... Yeah, so where my earliest memories will be um, late 80s is when I kind of was pulled into F1. So F1 was always in the house and it was always there on a Sunday in the background. I always paid attention of it. And one of the weirdest things and collections that I've got of like old old time toys was um maybe this says more about the fact that we were just poor but i had pieces of paper torn up uh with drivers names on and that's how i know when i started so it would have been 1988 um and i used oh, to i used to race them around on the bedroom or living room floor like with like blocks of like cars and stuff pretending that they were racing no idea who like was actually doing what, where, and when, and I'd like commentate over the top because I was clearly murried up by the time <laughs> I'd got there. Um, and so I don't have like specific memories of that time, but um, I remember finding like all of his um, his voice exciting and interesting, and just uh, being enthused. And I think the reason why Mansellmania kind of took off and that kind of era worked so well is it was just before um, you start to have diversification of uh, media channels and so I don't think you because you only had four channels maybe five if Sky TV was up and running by then um, and so you had that or the radio but then Murray I think was on the radio anyway so you couldn't kind of escape him from wherever he, you went he, he was ubiquitous yeah um and he was just also... To... Oh, sorry, go. So, sorry, I just want to cut in there to say um, you and Beetlejuice have something in common because uh, he's saying he did the same thing. He built uh, tracks out of toothpicks and Mikado sticks and points out that Michael Schumacher had horrible luck with mechanical failures in his living room. <laughs> Good. Couldn't happen to a nicer man. Sorry, carry on, Simon. <laughs> RNG is strong in Beetlejuice's living room. Um, yeah, so that's kind of why I think that was so big but also um it wasn't just that he uh went wider so it wasn't just formula one that we would be watching it would be btcc and who was the voice of that murray so he kind of came with us and it was back when uh, bbc used to do grandstand and so back in the day back in the day when basically bbc on the weekend was just a sports network and then in between the football pools where you'd have like Voxel one, full and new, oh, going yeah, really slowly, crawling. So you'd have like that boredom. Then you'd have like a couple of hours of snooker where everyone would fall asleep and be like half half dead. And then all of a sudden it would be like, now we're at Imola! And you'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> wake up. And it was just a complete contrast to everything else that was commentated on or just a different energy level. And I And that's what drew me in. Um, plus big vroom vrooms. So that's, yeah, I mean, those are my early memories. I mean, to be honest, you know, the fact that Britain is and has remained such a huge market for F1, I, I lay honestly at the, at the feet of Murray Walker to some extent. Agree. Because, you know, he got the, the world feed as same as same as everybody else, but no one could bring it alive like he could. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you know, whether he was alone or with someone else, he was always remarkable. I mean, obviously the clip that's been getting a lot of airtime at the moment is of him and James Hunt, which cracks me up every time I hear it. <laughs> uh, with James Hunt just live on BBC, just going, well, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the thing is, every time I listen back to um, Murray and James commentating together, Chalky yeah, there are moments that make me laugh. 
But at the same time, I, I do want to reach through the screen and shake James Hunt and say, stop being such a prick to Murray Walker, you disrespectful arsehole. Um, <laughs> I think actually, that grew over time, though, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, for me, I, I would honestly say that I enjoyed his partnership with Brundle the most. Same. Um, because they had a sort of bonhomie. Um, mm-hmm. And I think Brundle knew how to deal with him better, and Brundle had um, the same recent experience that Hunt had at the time, but without the arrogance, or not the same level of arrogance, let's say. Mm. Um, so I, I really enjoyed the, the, the Murray, uh, Martin, Brundle years. Uh, yeah. and I know the two of them uh, enjoyed working together very, very much. Um, do you remember the Murray and Martin shows where they would have like their little magazine type thing and then they would go off and um, like chat in the paddock on Saturday night between qualifying and race? Or did you not get to see that? Uh, I do. So I, I do. I did remember those. Uh, and I loved them. Uh, it was Damn. a shame that, you know, it wasn't something that continued. Um, and something, you know, that, that demonstrated to me is how adaptable he was, because that was really a change of format. Mm. And you know, the, the change as well, if you remember the change uh, from BBC to ITV coverage and suddenly they had to deal with commercial interruptions. But Murray never missed a beat. When it, when it came back from another fucking Bradford and Bingley commercial, there he <laughs> was, as if nothing had happened. And <clears throat> the tricky thing with that as well is that the world feed doesn't necessarily go on a break. So um, if you've seen other playouts they then like continue on and then like come back and rejoin viewers and it's it's quite seamless that they have to do it and you'd never have had to have dealt with that before um just sam in the <laughs> chat actually on my side just saying uh, jonathan palmer uh, was a bit underrated um i agree i think he was superb as a technical person i don't think he uh shone as a co-commentator so much i think he'd have been fantastic doing um ted stuff yeah, or as, an, or as an analyst with... Yes. Um, Jardine. Yeah, with Jardine and Rosenthal. Yes. Uh, them t- them two in a pub. They didn't tell Murray about commercials. To be honest, you'd be a brave man to say... Uh, Stop now, Murray. No! <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember there was a couple of incidents on ITV where they go to break and he's and there's one of them. And it, I think it was in a Canadian Grand Prix. And someone's breaking down as we go to commercial, and you can hear him as the Texaco logo like comes up, and he's going, "Get them back!" And it goes off to a break. <laughs> and, uh, it's so funny. But you see, I mean, that's, that's the other thing, right? It, it, it was so infectious, and I think that's why people forgave all the mistakes he made, right? Because you yeah. can't fake that kind of love. You um, can't. You can't fake being a, a, a giant fan. No, and and you know, there's a lot of commentators who do fake being a fan. And it, and it comes across. And, yeah. you know, I'm not saying they're not competent and not professional, but they were nowhere near as infectious as, as Murray. Uh, and all the greatest F1 commentary I can remember is Murray. You know, his emotional turn with uh, Damon Hill winning the 96 championship. You know, I have to stop. I've got a lump in my throat, mm-hmm. which I think everyone could feel. Um, yep. the, the, the way he handled Senna's uh, death on track mm-hmm. um, I mean that Grand Prix is still for me quite haunting to watch knowing what we know now yeah. and also knowing what Murray knew mm-hmm. because it's not like Murray didn't really know uh, certain things at certain times but you know he had a job to do um, and his delivery of the Senna death announcement um, I'm sure that haunted him forever but he, he did it remarkably well Um and, it, you know, it's because everything he does comes from uh, a place of genuine love of the sport. I never remember him criticising teams beyond, you know, well, they've gotten it wrong this year, but he always seemed to hold all the teams with the utmost regard. Mm. The same with drivers. Um, as I mentioned in my own personal Murray Tribute episode on my YouTube channel, he, he did say a few things that will probably get him cancelled today. I do remember him referring to uh, Alan Prost as the little frog. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I do recall him using liberally the term the tiny Japanese. Um, For Ukyo. Yeah. Um, 
And that probably would be seen as culturally insensitive now. But, you know, it was a different time back then, and Murray was, if anything, a product of his time. And I think we can forgive him a lot of that stuff anyway, just because of how much he loved the sport. And as I say, that's why people forgive him the mistakes. And he made a, he made a lot of mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. He did. But you could tell it wasn't from incompetence. I and mean, that's the thing as well. Some people, you know, did sort of allude that either he was losing his mind or age or he just was incompetent. But it wasn't. It was excitement. You know, he was in the fucking moment and he was excited, like genuine yeah. childlike bounce up <clears throat> and down excitement. What I'd also say as well, um, having a, and it's, it's no real comparison, but um, I do a lot of commentating in the sim racing world and the... Even in the last 10 years, the way how you have access to information, what's coming through in front of you, you have someone constantly talking in your ear, sometimes three to four people talking in your ear constantly as you talk out, and you're looking at various data streams. Now, that's what we've got now to deal with. Back then, he would have been looking sometimes through the exact same thing that you see and a giant text box like CFAX or teletext telling you a lap time so sometimes he's got real he, he's no like more informed necessarily than you are apart from him looking out the window so it doesn't surprise me that he kind of you have to have your eyes and ears everywhere and actually that's just tricky to keep going at the best of times as this podcast always shows with driving and talking <laughs> yes drive, driving and talking is difficult um, something um, I'd like to move on to if mm. I may, is, <clears throat> and we will get some more memories in and so on. We won't cut the stream too short or anything. Um, <clears throat> but I would like to query your favourite Murrayism. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I want to still... I think, it, I think it might be the same one that you're going to say, though. No, go on, please. Ukyo Katayama is <laughs> is the <laughs> finest formula uh, the finest formula finest japanese formula one driver that formula one has ever produced i think is the one that i'm thinking of only because mm. i was a huge fan and i can't remember the exact words of how it is but it's basically he says that he is the best driver that formula one has ever made <laughs> yeah. you're right that is that is one of my favorite all-time murray walker quotes <laughs> um <laughs> But I actually have, uh, really, I, I was stuck between two others. Uh, and if you've never grown up with Murray Walker um, and you, you've not heard his Murrayisms, I, I urge you to Google them. Mm -hmm. But these are things he genuinely said on TV. They were not cut out. Um, so possibly my favourite is uh, that car is completely unique apart from the one behind it, which is identical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um or uh, after Schumacher's car, I think it was, caught fire. Uh, and he said, there's nothing wrong with that car except that it's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, not wrong. It? It was, not there's, wrong. <laughs> there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that car except that it's on fire. Um, God bless him. Because uh, it's just something you say without even really thinking. Mm -hmm. um, what are his other ones? Um with half the race gone, there's still half the race left to go. Mm -hmm. um, I, that, that's indisputably a fact. Um, and of course, you know, this isn't really a Murrayism, but his, uh, Damon Hill's the world champion and I have to stop because there's a lump in my throat. Uh, yeah, I think I, there's, there's a really hilarious one with... Um... Uh, I think it's Tarquini when he crashes out in a BTC C race uh, and he does an Italian accent um, because the because the guy oh, no. that's crashed the oh, car no. he's, it's because he's driving for Alfa Romeo and the lead boss is there and he goes ah oh, that's a Macara and I'm like oh my god <laughs> I want Murray to voice Mario now <laughs> It's a me, Murray. <laughs> it's a me, a Murray Walker. Um, so he's like, that's a Macar. And he goes, yes, too right it is. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> he does a French voice in, in the same year as well for someone else. It's hilarious. <clears throat> I'll find it and send it to you. Um, oh, uh, Patrick Head won't be happy with that, but then he never is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
someone won't be in the Williams garage for the next race. Yeah. <clears throat> I enjoyed that one very much because that is incredibly true. Um, <laughs> yeah. Actually, he's also responsible for the most unremarkable F1 fact ever hmm. because he said um, Patrick Head's grandfather or great-grandfather was an admiral at the Battle of Waterloo. And it's like, I am not fucking surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing what I know about Patrick Head, he comes across as a Victorian era admiral. So <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so when I think back, I just think of Patrick Head as he is, but in like a tufted plumed admiral's hat. And that's mm -hmm. basically what I'm imagining. <laughs> like Blackadder. Um <clears throat> Yeah, and then of course, you know, we also go with him as the voice in video games. Yes. And um the first it's one Tras. Yeah, the first one obviously was 95, I think. Yeah. Um, with the first Psygnosis F1 game on mm -hmm. PlayStation. And, yeah, I mean, even though when you listen back to it now, the commentary sounds quite jarring and everything, the actual number of individual sound bites he gave was fucking huge. Yeah, yeah, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Because it's got, it's got several different versions of him shouting all 35 drivers' names. 13 teams you've got um oh the front wing's gone off he's really charging now it's Yatarella, <laughs> and you're like okay um as it goes on and um yeah i the fun fact as well if anyone's still got the game because i do um everyone else in all the other languages have also had their commentators recorded so i used to stick it on to german and then my mum was obsessed with um Gerhard Burger because it would go Gerhard Burger like that and she <laughs> she would go around like shouting it at people like she um, had to rats F1 to rats <laughs> yeah didn't know <laughs> who Gerhard Burger was but she was obsessed um, and then obviously uh, in the 1997 uh, one you used to get the Murray and Martin mode didn't you where you could get them to chat on the side with little talking heads it was a cheat code Oh, I didn't see that actually. Um, <gasps> sorry, sorry, I got, I got I got distracted for a moment by my phone. But also, Beetlejuice said uh, the commentary on that game introduced a non-English speaking world to watch uh, to to him. It's where he got his first Murray sound bites from. Oh wow! Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> even when I've seen like German let's players um, play that game, they play it with Murray on. Olivier Panis. Um, <laughs> it's Parnis, and then it's Panis yeah. in the next game where he's been corrected. <laughs> it's not a parsnip. It's Oliver Penis. I wish he'd done that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Try to do another little it's quick William's race. Number one. Yeah, it, it, exactly, Beetlejuice. Um, William's driver number one. Yeah. He's uh, also featured on uh, one of the Codemasters games from recent years. By the way, I'm pissed off that. Uh, Aaron Barnes got driver of the day when I got fastest lap and went down to 11th and drove back to second. So um, I don't know who Aaron Barnes is, but fuck him. <laughs> He'll never make it to F1. <laughs> He'll never make it, no. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. He... Sam's just put in the chat all, of my, all Martin Brando used to say was, you're right there, Murray. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> But he also commentated on the Codemasters game um, from 2013 or 14, And I saw mm. an interview um, with someone from Codemasters released, obviously, after the news of the death. Mm. Um, I am going to s switch up the uh, cars. Let's do uh, a quick yeah. mid-90s run, shall go we? On, then. Yeah. Uh, go on, then, you cheeky monkey. Uh, what, what are we going to be in, the Williams or one of the Benettons? Uh, we've done a Williams. Should we do a Benetton? If it, if I've got it. Uh, Beetlejuice votes for the Williams FW uh, eighteen. Uh, what's your vote, Simon? Uh, whatever I isn't in the Schumacher DLC. I can't, some of the Benettons are, some aren't. So, uh, and I think the B one nine five is the DLC one because that's the one he won his championship in, isn't it? Mm hmm. Or is it the one nine four? Um. See what you can select. You can select both. Uh, oh yeah, he did win it in both. You're right, Bill. Juice, a fucking dickhead. <clears throat> yeah, I uh, know it won't. It won't let me do it, any of them. So I, I'll, if I, if you do 
you could do one and I could oh, do the Schumacher Williams. Hill. Yeah, yeah. Schumacher Hill. All right. Yes. Um, and I'll just block out the grid with some random shit. Yeah. No. Do it. Do it. Do my, my broadcaster's gone. Oh, no. It's all right. It's all right. Let Discoursed. Me... Let me get it back. Boo. Twitch. You suck, Twitch. <laughs> I hear you're starting on Twitch, Mr. Simon. Yeah, um, I've become an affiliate because uh, where I do my music distribution through DistroKid, um, once you get a certain amount of Spotify plays, it gives you free access to go straight in as a Twitch affiliate. So I thought, why not? There'll Ooh. be a birthday stream uh, this weekend to test out me going on Twitch. It'll be an absolute carnage fest, uh, but people are welcome to join. I don't know what I'm playing. It'll be a selection of all kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, what track going. are we going for? Ooh... Pick your track, sir. Suzuka? Yeah, let's do Suzuka. That's where he'll win the championship. Yeah, and where Prost and Senna would collide an awful lot. Sounds good to me. And, uh, yeah, let's do the same again. One shot and 25%, yeah? Does yeah. that sound okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got the time. Now, oh, my stream keeps dropping. Boo. Our connections are a bit better than what they were earlier, though, so that's good. To the game, at least. Um, I'm just going to activate my stream again and tell everyone to come watch you <laughs> okay that's all I can do it would have been Sen it would have been Senna's third win in a row if he hadn't won the if he had won the two before excellent great one there Sam no. um Schumacher smashing into the back of Coulthard in Spa 98 when he's trying to lap him and he shouts <laughs> oh god yes uh, Rhino, that I love the back and forth between him and Brundle. Jerez 97 over Fontana holding up Villeneuve. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, one second. Uh, welcome back, Beetlejuice. I presume that's you. Um, my stream keeps dropping, mate. Um, so if it goes down again, uh, just maybe pop over and join Simon on YouTube because I think it's just going to keep cutting out on us, but hopefully not. Uh, but yeah, please continue, Simon. Yeah, sorry. I was just reading through what people had put in the chat. Um... And then saying Ralph was playing the white man by not doing the same as Fontana. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. I, I, he did say that, I remember. Awkward. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, cool. Let's get... I don't think I've... Okay, let's throw around the Esther Benetton. Oh, this uh, cockpit's high, or I'm sitting low in it rather. I d I've noticed this in uh, when I'm playing Race Room at the moment, which I've got really into on PC. I always have to sit and buckle about with the seat and put it up really, really high because then it makes me feel like I can see further. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> which is not how television screens work, Simon. No, I know, but it gives me more of the more of the track on the screen and less of the cockpit. But um, in my head, I always feel like I can go faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you say that, but um, if I can't hear the engine noise in this game, I, I lose like five, six tenths of a second, and I've never been able to figure out why, because listening to the engine note makes no difference at all to what's going on. Does that mean that you change gear on like the throaty gurgle? No, I, I don't think I use an audio cue. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't get it, but it is what it is. Mm. Um, shall we talk uh, now then about um, Murray's special relationship with some of the drivers? Um, yeah. Obviously, we know that he and Mansell got along very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, I won't go too deeply into that, except that I enjoyed very much Murray flicking him <laughs> on the head uh, when he had that head injury, um, yeah. because it couldn't happen to a nicer bloke. Um but really, for me, I mean, and obviously we, we've already mentioned he was close with Hills, and we'll touch on that in a bit as well, but I want to start by talking about his relationship with Schumacher, because that's something that I almost didn't really understand. Mm. Um, because, you know, he was an advocate for the British drivers, he was a big fan of Hill. Schumacher was not only Hill's biggest rival, but he made some pretty dirty moves 
um, at, at different times. Mm. Um, but Murray just he rated him as the as the greatest, clearly. Yeah. And no matter how many times Schumacher did something a bit dodgy, <clears throat> true, yeah, true Beetlejuice. Murray respected the hell out of Michael, just like he adored Senna. Um, mm. tr- yeah, true, true. I think maybe it's his, just his love for his, love for the sport overrode a lot of a lot of his maybe allegiance to to, to British drivers or. He... I think maybe he recognised the competitive <clears throat> spirit as well that would drive people to do the things that Senna and Schumacher did sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's... You can separate... <clears throat> I got the impression that you could separate the greatness or, and respect for some things and then uh, the ability to say, that's. but I didn't like the thing you did. I, that doesn't mean that I don't necessarily... Dis- res- I, I'd respect you less, if that makes sense. Um, it, he would target specific things and then move on from them, but still talk about the person as a whole being good. Uh, yeah, good point, Beetlejuice. He he enjoyed when the dirty move didn't play out um, mm. versus Villeneuve. Yeah, that's that for me is a genuine historic moment in F one as well that <clears> I'm forever <throat> associated with with Murray. Um, and what see I associate that. I associate that almost with Brundlemore because he says, you've hit the wrong part, my friend. But I, <laughs> I don't think you'd have got that kind of reaction unless you had two people that really got on well together. Oh, not very good off Ooh, the your line. your teammates got past me. I span a lot of power away, though. It's my own fault because I've turned traction control off to try and be faster, and it hasn't necessarily worked in my favour. He is the Villeneuve to your hill, Simon. <laughs> don't let him get the win, and don't let me get the win. It's all right. I've got his um, oil temp sorted for later. <laughs> I have to say, these cars are incredibly squirrely. Yeah, I'm so spoiled with um, being able to just floor the power down. I'm having to remember how to cadence accelerate, let alone brake. Um, okay, with the first lap drama out of the way, <clears throat> or like the, the first part of the first lap drama out of the way, I'm not going to make a diving attack on the Williams here. I'm going to play it cool. We've got 13 laps and a pit stop still, so... Um, <clears throat> pit stop? Yeah, I have to stop. I don't know about you. No? Oh, well, apparently the game wants to punish me. <clears throat> <laughs> I've been a very bad boy. Murray has disapproved. <laughs> <clears throat> Murray disapproves. Murray disliked this. <laughs> Boo. I also remember, actually, um, him commentating on Jos Verstappen being barbecued in the Benetton. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. And, and that reaction is pretty burned in my memory because, you know, it was shocking. Mm -hmm. It was alarming to everybody, and particularly um, given that... (laughs) Burned in my memory, badunch, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Not as burned as it is in Yoss's, (laughs) badunch. Oh, I'm losing so much time by taking bad lines through these corners, but the car just seems to want to go where it wants to go, which Mm -hmm. is not necessarily where I'm pointing it. But also when Verstappen was in the Tyrrell, or um, when he took over from Magnussen at Stewart, because I do remember actually Murray having a sort of sympathy towards Jan Magnussen, um, yeah. but also it sa- he sounded resigned to the fact that you know it's time to get rid of him, mm-hmm. uh, because you know it was. Um, to be honest with you, I kind of expected the same thing to happen to Kevin. Um, when Kevin entered the sport because, you know, he was supposed to be McLaren's next big thing uh, in the same way that Jan Magnussen was once McLaren's ne- next big thing and mm-hmm. we know it didn't really work out with Jan and then he went bald uh, and now he drives <laughs> a Corvette. So, you know, it really has been a backward slide for the poor guy. Um, <clears throat> F1's last smoking driver, if I remember rightly. Yes, yes he is and he was a hell of a smoker. Well, still is. Um, I believe. Don't think he's quit. 
But, I mean, something else that I've been wondering, hmm. um, you know, as I remember now, all the times Murray Walker was commentating on Toru Takagi in a Tyrrell in a gravel trap. <laughs> what he would have made of the hybrid era of Formula 1. Um, because I don't think I ever heard heard his opinions on it, to be honest. No. I, th- I still think he would have loved it. I think he would be... <sighs> it's interesting because when you look at how close a field is today rather than what it was beforehand um i think maybe where he might have struggled slightly is that technology the the takeover of technology versus being able to make the human difference and so long as he could still see that there was a human difference in it um i think he was kind of like wowed by technology and uh, found it impressive but it's the human emotion and spirit that he was drawn to that would be able to bring it out by wrestling those cars around everywhere. So, so long as there was still the human element to shine, I think he'd be okay. Um, I think he would have much more enjoyed it 2017 onwards when it started to become big, chunky cars, um, starting to sort Back things on the out. Slicks. Yeah, yeah. I I wonder what he would have thought <coughs> of. Um, didn't hear his opinions on DRS particularly. I'm, I'm not sure he would have approved of that, to be honest. Um, I mean, maybe it would have made commentating more exciting in one sense, but I don't think it really would have done overall because the, the overtakes would feel artificial. Um, and and that, that's the thing about the era he commentated on. Sometimes there were huge gaps, but everything that happened happened authentically. Hmm. Um, but I don't know if that's just my rose-tinted nostalgia, right? Because I, 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 I'm not ashamed to say I wouldn't be as big a fan of F1 today as I am without Murray Walker. Yeah. But there's, there's absolutely no way. Because he interpreted the sport for the layman because he was essentially a layman himself. Mm-hmm. And his love for it was genuine and infectious. And it yeah. sucked you in. Yeah. There, there was just no way I'd be the fan that I am. Um, and at the same time, you know, I kind of associate him with an era of V10s, V8s, V12s, uh, huge grids, mm-hmm. wide cars, fat tyres, um, drivers punching each other in the face. <laughs> and all of it seems better. <laughs> but I don't actually know if it was. And I wonder if that's down to Murray as well. I wonder if the reason we have such wonderful memories is is down to his presentation as much as what was going on because really the field was so spread in those days 10 yeah, seconds you know, you, back to front wasn't it i mean you get these these moments you know like the the villeneuve schumacher collision or schumacher and hill colliding mm-hmm. um or like you know some photo finishes here and there or you know i think the most famous murray clip ever the mansell's tire exploding Mm-hmm. Uh, with Murray's exclamation, which I see on every F1 show at all times. Um, <laughs> like, those were were genuinely remarkable events, but when you watch back old races, a lot of it is actually remarkably processional. Yes, yeah. But still, I remember those seasons super fondly. In a way that recent seasons, I don't. You know, like, I, I was watching... Um, a YouTube series about the worst teams in F1 ever. And they did an episode on HRT. And I realised that I remembered HRT, but I essentially blanked all their races from my memory. Aww. Like, no, but really, when I try and think of like memorable moments from 2010, 2011, 2012, I think the only thing I come up with is uh, Jensen Button, uh, last to first at, at, at Canada. Pasta Maldonado's win. Um, I... St- even that I forget happened because it feels like like the universe was playing a cruel practical joke. <laughs> like, you know, our alien overlords were just tweaking with things to see if we'd notice, you know, like a glitch in the Matrix. But no one questioned it and then look where we've ended up. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I will disagree, but I think that might be because I, I'm slightly mildly obsessed uh, with back marker teams and all of that kind of stuff. And actually, I think everything up to... And including potentially 2013, I was all right with because it wasn't the hybrid era. Um, 
it's uh, it's but um to flip it an, another way which to prove your point though i can't think of croftisms that i'd actually no. want to replay back i can think of there's a fantastic website that does uh brundalisms um which i but isn't enjoy. that usually him being like a prick to people <clears throat> it is him being like slightly grumpy and um but i find that quite funny um i know some other people might not but um yeah it's it's him being silly um whereas uh like watching ted be awkward is is entertaining in its own little way um i always thought james allen came across with the same passion um for motorsport as murray walker did and just was unfortunate that he was the next person to step into the shoes of someone that is incomparable um yeah i mean don't get me wrong i mean there's other commentators i enjoy i actually quite like crofty to be honest i don't like, mind I have him. an affection i have an affection for crofty he's mm. he's never going to be a murray but i mean he has sort of in one sense taken the the, the place of being sort of that reassuring tone that you hear on a sunday do you know what I mean? But he's more background than Murray ever was. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of have an affection for Crofty. And, you know, I like Ben Edwards as well, to be honest. Yes. And that's the only other duo who I rank up with the Hunts, uh, the, the Hunt and Murray and the Martin and Murray. Um, I did actually quite rate James Allen and Martin Brundle together. Um, would be uh, Ben Edwards and John... Um, Watson, yes, thank you. Yeah, I, Ben Edwards and John Watson on Eurosport, a classic double act. Um, but you know, I'll take Murray all day, every day. Yes. Um, yes, the grip levels are falling away. How perceptive of you, race engineer? What gave it away? The fact that my arse is halfway around the apex before I am. <laughs> is it raining? Or have I got cataracts? No, it's just exceptionally grey skies, which happens quite a lot in this game. I've had that guys that are really, really dark, and I'm like, I can't fucking see anything. Cataract in uh, memory of Murray. Um, <laughs> speaking of which, um, hmm. I want to talk very quickly about the Frontier F1 management game. Ooh. Because I'm super excited for it, and they've said nothing about it since they announced they got the license and it's not coming out till 2022 and I don't think I can survive that long <laughs> I need it because you and I need to do a multiplayer on it and we need to insert I'm going to get a soundboard with Murray on it because we're going to need it okay um, because I want you and I to put I mean we've driven against each other for over a decade mm -hmm. uh, and you whooped my ass for the first eight years um, I want to see how it is when we step into the management ring. I think that would be fantastic. I think it would be really, really good fun, because also it would be easier for us to talk. <laughs> yeah. Which is something we've long struggled with. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll be keen to see what kind of... T I, I hope you can basically add two new teams to the grid. Uh, but if not, I'm curious to see who you'd, uh, who you'd take over and how you'd run them. See now that there's not an, a, a true back marker, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to pull up my Minardis, and I feel like I wouldn't want to touch Toro Rosso now because it's Toro Rosso, not Minardi, ruining my DNA. Um. Yeah, I, I tell you something though. I I, I do kind of hope again uh, in memory of Murray, keeping it all tied together. Mm -hmm. I really hope this rumor that Paul Stoddart wants to <laughs> fund another entry to F1 comes true. He yeah. may actually be. I was thinking about this the other day, and he may be possibly my all-time favorite team principal <laughs> no really because i was i was uh, listening to uh, some of the things that he'd said um <clears throat> during his time in f1 and all of it comes from a position of a guy who loves racing yeah like when you when you really look at what he's saying and how he's saying it um and you know how pissed off he was at his team getting points in the United States because the race was shit for the fans mm -hmm. like I, I've got nothing but respect for that 
Yeah. Because not a lot of team principals would say that. You know, they'd politicise and they'd obfuscate and everything. Um, and it's just a shame that the Stoddart era and the uh, Murray Walker era didn't really overlap. Because I'd love to see Murray interviews Paul Stoddart. I think that would have been yes. fantastic. There's... <clears throat> because that's the other thing as well. His interviews, he could always get an interview, couldn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's down to... Um you're not running your own social medias so therefore he was he was if you wanted a message to go out he had the clout and the prowess and the nous of interviewing obviously he came from a advertising background um so knew kind of how to how to sell something and how to sell uh, a person because you buy people you don't buy uh abstract goods or or a concept so yeah it makes perfect sense and then he was he was i think that's also part of why um sorry i'm rambling but i think it's it's because i was trying to get around the s's and i couldn't (laughs) (laughs) back on track um i think that's also why he was able to stay very approachable and be welcomed in all the garages is because he's so open and um friendly because that then pays him back tenfold because people would then tell him extra things and he would be able to get the extra juice in an interview and people like so many journalists these days would be busy selling out their credibility over clickbait items to get more things through because clicks are what matter you don't get journalistic integrity like that so often anymore um, no you really don't and you really that's don't that's why he would be able to stroll into any paddock and be welcomed because he was there as a fan to sell the person the story the atmosphere and he knew how to do it well and he was the front door to all the tv screens and the sponsor time and everything well the thing is as well you know you'd get a fair shake in the interview right yes he wouldn't try and twist your words there'd be some level of you know he would call you out on stuff which interview is it I'm thinking of that he did with Schumacher? Was it after he got banned? He got he got a ban, didn't he? Or he, did he get mm-hmm. disqualified? Ninety four he did. Oh, uh, ninety seven he got disqualified for from. Yeah, and and th- there was another event I'm thinking of. Uh, well, there's a few from Schumacher's career, right? But ninety four remember... he got done for two races, didn't he? Yeah, and then didn't he get black flagged somewhere in a three race ban or something? Yeah, Silverstone um, ninety four. Yeah, and then I think this was later in his career though, because it, it was it was when he was at Ferrari I think, and I remember seeing a Murray sit down interview with him during really sort of fraught and tense times, and I, I even at the time I remember thinking I wonder how the hell he got Michael Schumacher to sit down with him because mm-hmm. the, he doesn't want to talk. You know, this isn't a career highlight for him. Unless it was a uh, mind you, he's already retired by the time they got to Austria, two thousand and two. Yeah, I can't think of it. Uh, didn't he come maybe it's that actually didn't he come back for an interview because I, I, I've seen him interview Lewis Hamilton so I know he comes back occasionally to do interviews yeah yeah there and was one it was where the he crashed person he talked to maybe it was it might have been when he crashed in qualifying at Monaco on purpose yeah I, well, I'm going to look this up and for a, a, an F1 podcast of 11 12 years standing I should know this so I apologise that I don't but I think it's because there's a few sort of iconic Murray Michael interviews, mm. and I'm kind of blending them together in my mind. Um, but you know, he could he could always get the story, and um, you know, he 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 also he got uh, he got insider uh, information and, and interviews from Tyrrell as well when they got um, when they got disqualified. Mm-hmm. Um, if I remember correctly, they were topping their car up with lead shot. Yes. To bring it, to bring it um, up to bring weight. it to the right weight. Yeah. And they got disqualified when uh, Benetton mechanics found like little lead balls all over their pit box. <laughs> yeah. And wondered where they came from and saw they were coming out of a water hose uh, at Tyrrell. <laughs> um, but you know, and like, like when Benetton got kicked out of the championship he got an interview um mm-hmm. but you know 
yeah, that yeah. was just Murray. That was just Murray. And I think also because he wasn't so technically minded, they didn't mind letting him behind the curtain. Because, you know, it's not like he's going to see, uh, you know, a, a new diffuser or something and know what it means. Yeah. If you had um, Karun Chandok ro- rooting around in there, I'd be like, no, get out, please. Because he's busy about to tell everyone in all the world. And also, if Murray did pick up anything, they would explain it to him, as you'd say, in layman's terms. So that he could then give the layman's version of it to make it accessible for F1 fans across the board. Um, And the other thing I'd say as well um, is that he was such a fan of motorsport. The other reason why drivers, I think, would always open up to him is that he'd probably already seen them in the junior categories and had kind of been a figure in their life right from diddly squat. So uh, Martin Brundle would um, said on his stuff with Sky that they first met Murray in like, 1982 because he'd come on those weekends down to whatever English track it was to watch like a junior category to see who were the up and coming people. And he'd go and like chat to them and meet them all and be in the fly, uh, fly on the wall. That's how he uh, started knowing about Senna. He would have no doubt done the same with Schumacher Hill. Obviously, he already had that family connection. Um, but all the drivers he was like that so he picked out like Jean Alessi as a big thing early on um, and I remember him talking about uh, like Frentzen was a big one uh, coming up because he'd run junior categories, Panis being Formula uh, 3000 and yeah. all of that it was um, all, the, all of that different time and era because there was only a few routes for you to get up the ladder And most of that involved at least one, if not a whole season of racing in the UK. So he was already there in his off season, in his off weekends, mooching around. So you get, you you trust those people because you can see that it's not, it's um, to spoil an oil of Olay commercial. It's not just skin deep. No, I mean, that's true. I mean, his depth and breadth of knowledge of the drivers as human beings was, was Mm. remarkable because, you know, he'd often say things uh, you know about drivers that often you weren't even aware were on the grid you know i remember him speaking about uh dominic chatterella uh and his career prior to f1 or mark Genet, and he'd tell you the story about how mark Genet was an accountant who quit because his passion was formula one and everyone said he couldn't do it mm-hmm. um and i love mark Genet, and he's been a ferrari f1 test driver till this very day can mm-hmm. you imagine that like you've been an accountant for like the first 30 years of your life and then somehow <laughs> you quit to follow your dream and it works <laughs> like, I'd definitely read his autobiography if he's got one these books ain't fast enough yeah uh, speaking of which uh, if anyone's interested to hear more about Murray and learn a bit more about him there is a biography uh, he's got an autobiography as well but I recommend the biography it's called mm. uh, It Was Never Work which is obviously a, a Murray Walker quote when asked about his, his career mm-hmm in Formula One, and he said it was it, for me. It was never work, um, which I think definitely comes comes across. Is this the last lap? Yes. Thank God, because my tires are on seventy percent, and I'm going to have a blowout. Oh wow! And while that would be hilarious and very failcast, I feel like I would have let Murray down. I feel like we'd need to have played his Nigel Mansell tire blowout quote over the top of it. <laughs> that can be a YouTube short if that happens. That's also then it's the very zero. first. That's the very first time I think that I've got better tyre wear than you. It must be car dependent, because you're always better on tyres than me. Historically, I have been better on tyres than you, but uh, this car, for some reason, I keep spinning the the light in the rears up all the time. So I've been a bit fat fingered on the throttle, maybe. Um, it's also I've turned traction control off, so it's a bit more sensitive. Oh, I don't know what I mean. That is proverbially speaking the sound of the police. <laughs> well, I I hope and and would like to wish that that was uh, a, a fitting if understated tribute to the the great man himself. Um, mm-hmm. I, I hope you guys have enjoyed listening to our reminiscences and, and memories of. A guy who was integrally woven into our childhood mm-hmm. um, and without whom this podcast mm. wouldn't be happening. Yes. Because I wouldn't give a shit. 
<laughs> um, would you, <clears throat> if, would you, oh, well, I was just thinking, like, what would be a good way to honour Murray Walker in the longer term? Um, and one of the most interesting ways that people do it often is to name a corner after them. And I wonder what corner would be worthy of Murray Walker's name. Oh, that is an excellent question. I mean, the problem is you'd, you'd be sort of left with newer tracks, wouldn't you? Mm. Um, <clears throat> but for me, what I'd prefer is to rename the Autosport Award Ooh. for Murray Walker. You know, the one that gets you a guaranteed death one test. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Beetlejuice like suggests the start finish straight at Silverstone. Uh, he also says, uh, tell Simon to plug his Twitch channel. So please plug your Twitch channel. And also it was good seeing you, Beetlejuice. Thank you for popping in. Yeah, thanks, Beetlejuice. Uh, my Twitch channel will be twitch.tv forward slash higher plane games. Very, Ooh. very, very, very simple. Um, you'll see the same purple and yellow logo and everything everywhere. So come join the fun. Um, yeah, I, I think something that brings young drivers into f1 i think would definitely be a murray walker um kind of kind of kind of thing like a murray walker memorial trophy um yeah i'd like i'd like to see that i think um because you know he was passionate about the up-and-comers he mm -hmm. was a, a strong advocate of, of young drivers he'd always learn their story like we were saying and um i can't think of a much more fitting tribute than that because i can't think of many great corners that don't have a name yeah i really can't Ooh. you know unless unless you know we want to name a corner in vietnam after him which doesn't seem very fair um manor house in the chat has said is murray is at snetterton after him and i don't think it is i think it's after a motorbike rider but i'll double check um I, also i'd like pizza hut to do a murray walker memorial pizza <gasps> is that where like one slice is facing the wrong way round or is upside down or something? the pizza's twisted in the middle yeah yeah <laughs> it's a tongue twister yeah and and we need damon hill and martin brundle in the uh in the commercial <laughs> there's little uh cheesy oh i was gonna say cheesy helmets on the crust but that's something for an entirely different Oof. website <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that, that that's that's that went into a different realm of territory then, mate. Eh? <laughs> uh, Bumpy goes down to earth with a grind. Oh. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, listen. Thank you so so much to everyone who took the time to join us. I know it's a bit out of sync. Um, yeah. But uh, we both felt it it was a an event that needed uh, marking. I hope you've enjoyed uh, enjoyed joining us for our walk down memory lane. The regular Felcast F1 returns uh, one and a half weeks from now on Saturday, where we will be racing in Canada. Um, and It'll be the Grand first Prix race World. of the season as well. Grand Prix World. Uh, if it's not already live on YouTube, it will be live on YouTube very soon. The, the, the upload went wonky, so I'm hoping that it's fixed itself while I've been doing this. Uh, what's going on for you, Simon? Anything uh, cracking this week? Uh, no, just... For, um couple of game reviews coming out um got some stuff also coming out over on traction.gg um where i'm doing some freelance work for them and uh, there'll be the twitch stream over on twitch.tv forward slash high playing games at some point saturday or sunday depending on how drunk i am when i press play delightful i love it um also uh i hope to be back up and running on twitch soon it's been a, a difficult few months um i've gone back to the retro setup today um obviously in memory of murray and also because i'm i'm lazy uh but hopefully i will see more of you guys around have a very good one take care of yourselves uh, especially you beetlejuice thanks for joining and uh, we will see you all in a week and a half if we don't see you before Mwah, bye love you bye bye <laughs>